church. We're glad to have you with us today. Chad is still uh, trying to get the live stream going. Is that right? Yeah, we gotta wait till 10, so. We have to wait? Yeah, wait till 10. Oh, I didn't get a second. Yeah, sorry. Right. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> it's set to automatically start at 10 a.m. Oh, well. Well, we are glad to have you uh, joining us this morning for worship. I'm going to go ahead and start, and hopefully the live stream kicks in at the appropriate time. And we have an interesting hum today. All right. I feel like we're going to begin with prayer today. Well, we are glad to have you join us for worship, whether you're here in person, hearing a strange hum in the room, or if you're joining online, hopefully you're not going to have a hum today. Uh, you know, this has been one of those weeks where I've realized, like, it's good to have friends you can call on for help. And so uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of volunteers this week. Uh, our projector stopped working last week. We had some issues with the computer sound, and we called up Kent, and he took care of it for us this week. And uh, I have noticed something that uh, Andrew Tuma drives a particular kind of truck, and I said, hey, Andrew, uh, any chance, like, if I ever was in a bind, would you be willing to pick up the trailer? And uh, sure enough, I called him later this week and said, hey, my transmission blew up. <laughs> I promise I didn't plan this, but I was just thinking of the beauty of having a community that you can call upon. So no matter what you're going on, uh, going through in life, whether you're going through a hard time, or you have annoying technical difficulties, or maybe a car repair, and you need to call on a community, it's good to know that the people around you are people that you can trust and are willing to lend a hand and help out, even if they're complete strangers. And that's part of the beauty of building a church community. And so, as I mentioned, we're going to begin with prayer. I uh, think the humming went away. Oh, she yeah. <laughs> said it again. God, we thank you uh, that we can come together today and worship. And no matter what happens throughout our week, we have a community that can come together and support each other to come and worship Jesus together. And so God, we pray that there wouldn't be anything that distracts us today. But right now, as we quiet our hearts, we surrender these things to you and we say, God, I don't want to worry about this at this moment. I don't want this to bother me. I just want to meet with you. Because Jesus, we do need each other. We need you each and every day of our lives. So fill this place with your presence. Encourage our hearts and our minds as we come to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to stand as we begin worship this morning. I'll just add to that, that not only do we have a community in Rhode Island, but we have a God who fights for us. And that's what this verse is about.
Well, it means after 10 years of hard work, we've finally grown up enough to pay our own bills, balance our own checkbook, and all those wonderful things that an existing church might do. And so we don't have a building of our own yet, but chartering is kind of that next step. And so as we pursue conversations about purchasing land in the area, as we look at borrowing money to build a building in the future, one of the things we want to see is that you can charter with your denomination, that you can establish membership, finances, all of that good stuff. And so we're going to have a couple of uh, Sundays right after church. You can join us in the teacher's lounge. And we're just going to have a conversation about what that looks like here in Elkin Market, what that means for us. And so that if you want to become a chartering member, uh, you can let us know and officially join the church. And so uh, the next one is going to be next Sunday after church, uh, the 18th, and March 3rd will be the second one. So you don't have to go to both. Choose one or the other. If you can't attend those, let us know, and we'll figure out another option as well. So we're pretty excited about that. With that, I'm going to invite Pastor Melissa to come up and share the word this morning. All right, God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. I just want to go back to one thing that Pastor Gordon just mentioned in the announcements, because he's, he's like more even keel than I am. And I tend to be a little bit more excited and passionate. I'm like, you guys, we are talking about purchasing land. Like, should, like we're getting and that. That is what we're having. Let's celebrate So we are so excited about what God is doing here in Elk New Market. We just, we just believe that God loves the people of Elk New Market. And so we want to celebrate that. Okay, real quick, um, before we get going here. Uh, we have message notes that have been in our bulletin. We've kind of done this all along. But last week, for those of you who don't know, I actually pastor two churches, and so I come from Capitol Rock uh, before I come here. And last week, I started something new, I don't know, and uh, I put together a little, like, daily reading thing. So, you know, they liked it. I thought, well, I'm just going to try it this week, see what you guys think. So I don't know if they ended up in your bulletins. If they didn't, they're on the back table. Each, there's five of them, like maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? However you want to do that. It's just a suggestion, something to read, and then kind of a question that goes along with, you know, what what might be something we might pull out of that particular reading. So if you're, if you're one who's like, hey, I kind of want to read the Bible, but I don't know necessarily how to get into that, grab one of those, and maybe that'll help you with some direction uh, for this next week. So, all right. Well, we are in our series called Heart Engaged, and just to give you a little peek at uh, what our relationship sometimes looks like with my better half, and he, he, he really is the better half. What, what that guy can do is, I mean, he just blows me away as many talents, but every once in a while, I don't know if you're in a relationship with a sibling, your kids, maybe it's just Gordon and I, but every once in a while we have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, kid. Right? Maybe I'll say discussions. Right? And they really, I'm thinking about our last one. And our last one went something kind of like this. <clears throat> I said to him, I'm right. <laughs> Obviously, I'm right. We both know I'm right. You see that I'm right. Now you understand why I am right. To which he responded, you're not right. You're wrong. Don't you see why you're wrong? I don't think you're right. And I responded back to him and said, obviously you're wrong. Because I'm right. I don't see how you can't see that you're the one who's wrong. And he said, I'm not wrong. I'm right. You don't even make sense. <laughs> and I said to him, what's that? I know I'm right, and I'll give you something to make sense about. Anybody ever said something like that? He goes, yeah, I wish you would. That's the whole point, right? Okay, is this anyone else, or is it just Pastor Gordon and I that have these conversations? Amen. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're broken people in relationship with other broken people. Whether that's our siblings, our families, our neighbors, our co-workers, depending on who it is, right? So we are in a sermon series for this month called A Heart engaged. And last week, Pastor talked about that proposal that really Christ gave us a new commandment. He said, look, love has been the commandment all along, but I'm coming to you and I'm explaining it in a new way because it's fulfilled in me. I am the fulfillment of that new commandment. Outside of me, you really don't find a great source of love. And this week, we are talking about, ooh, that hurt. 
And sometimes it's the conflict, right? Sometimes it's that conflict with one another. Sometimes it's that conflict with our kids, our parents, our siblings. Sometimes that point of, oh, that hurt, is because we don't want to admit we might actually be wrong. Or that we may be right, but we are acting wrong. I have, a, I have a saying that I've been saying for years. I said, you can know you are right and still be totally wrong. I don't know if that's in my message notes there. You can, you can know you're right <laughs> and still be totally wrong, right? Anybody, anybody there? So today we're talking about that moment in a conflict where maybe you're right, maybe you're not right, but you know you're not necessarily acting right. And, and I don't know about you, and maybe, <laughs> But I think that I've matured. I think I've grown up. I've had amazing moments with the Lord. He's transformed me. He's changed me. He's done all these things in me. And then there's these moments where I just want to have an adult meltdown. And I just want to give it to my flesh. And I know the things I should do, but my flesh just kind of says I don't want to. And I just want to sort of act like a toddler. Anyone else here today feel that way? Sometimes. Okay. I'm not alone. So we're going to be in the book of 1 John through this series. So I'm in 1 John, I'm going to be in chapter 3. If you're following along in scripture, I'm going to be in 1 John chapter 3. I'm also going to be in Colossians chapter 3 if you kind of want to flip back and forth with the two. If you don't have scripture or a Bible, you can grab one from the back table. They're free, they're there for you. Otherwise, go ahead and follow along in your, in your phone if you would like. But in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, we start with this kind of hard story. It says... This is the message you should have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. It's been there since the beginning of time. God loved us. God wanted to have a loving relationship with us. God wanted to invite us into a loving relationship with one another. We should love one another. So it goes on to say, we must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother, whose name is Abel, his brother Abel was doing what was righteous. And then he kind of, the, the, the writer, author, Paul here, kind of goes on to describe, or John, John kind of goes on to describe how Cain and Abel sort of become an example of the world, right? So he says, so don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Kind of like, okay, Cain is sort of a representation of some of the evil that's going on in the world. And, and, and able sort of that righteousness that we find in God. It's an interesting story. If you don't know the story of Cain and Abel, they're the, they're the, the first story of a murder that happens. Uh, Cain and Abel were, were the sons of Adam and Eve, and um, from the beginning, God has always wanted to know, do we have a heart for God? God loves us. He pours out his love on us. Do we love God in return? And so in the, in the Old Testament, there is this practice of offering something of yours, right? You might think of that today as maybe we give it a financial offering or something like that. It was, it was the same then. And so in this story, Cain offers his grain offering, because that's what he did. He was a farmer of the fields. And Abel offers his, 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 his herds, his a sacrifice of his herds, because that's what he did. And, and we have this, this reference. And when you read the story, it says that God does not accept Cain's offering, but he accepts Abel. And at first you're like, what? what? Like, why? Why? Why, God? That seems it's kind of harsh. Why didn't he give me the boat? He gave you something. Why? Why doesn't, why doesn't he accept Cain's offering? But as we read through the story, as you get through the story, you will see that Cain's outward choices are actually visible to what is happening on his inside, and his attitude on the inside. And the Lord asks him, he says, look, if you change your attitude, I will accept your offering too. I know that it is an attitude of your heart. And so the, what we see on the outside of this story is Cain's attitude actually takes on death and darkness and the bitterness in his heart reaches to the point where we have the first murder and he takes out the life of his brother out of bitterness and the and rage. Now, if you thought that your relationship with your sibling was rough, if you thought that you had a, had a hard relationship with your sibling, hopefully at least they're not out to like, take you out of this life, right? So this is a, this is a, a hard story, but this scene gives us a, 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 an inside peek of what's happening inside Cain's heart. See, God knows the heart of both of these brothers. And so I'm not going to read the whole story 
you today. Um, if you're interested in reading it, it's Genesis chapter 4. I'm just going to read a couple, uh, just a selection of it here. But in Genesis chapter 4, God is talking to Cain after he's given his offering. And, and he's saying, I don't accept your offering. He's saying, because I, I know the motive of your heart. And, and then he talks to Cain and he says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out, because sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Sin is crouching at the door. You know, God didn't, he didn't need the grain, right? He didn't, he didn't need the, the herds from, from Abel either. He, he wasn't that that he cared about. He cared about the condition of Cain's heart. And when you go back a little earlier in the story, in verses 3 and 4, it said that Cain gave some of his grain, while Abel gave the best portions of his offering. God is looking at the heart. God knows the heart of these, of these two brothers. One is giving out of a heart of love, and the other is not. And in verse 7, we have this line that says, look, sin is crouching at your door. And I know that there are moments in my life where sin is crouching at the door of my heart. Can you ask yourself, can you look, what sin might be crouching at the door of your heart? What attitude are we carrying? When I'm tempted to hold on to bitterness or my own self-righteousness, I mean, is this just Cain and me? Or do others of you feel this moment when sin is crouching at your door? Does anybody else struggle with that hard pull? We, we, we know what we want to do, uh, but we want to choose the attitude. We're tempted to choose our emotions in our heart. But you know, we know that emotions deceive us, don't they? Love is not just emotions. And so 1 John warns us, look, the love of Christ leads to life. Choosing darkness leads to death. Back in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead inside. You know, Cain and Abel were real people. I believe that this document to the Bible is full of, of um, stories of messy people living on messy things. And here we have this reference to the, to the first murder, right? But over time, Cain and Abel have also become a symbol for us. When we go back and we look into verse 15, it says, anyone who hates another brother or sister, it might be your real brother or sister, <laughs> might, might just be, might be people in your life, right? Is really a murderer of the heart. We're talking about the matter of the heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. It's not that God doesn't want to invite us into eternal life, it's that you have not experienced real life yet, and you still have that hatred dwelling within your heart. Right? When Cain was not willing to turn from his bitterness, it literally turned to death. Only in Christ, only in Christ Jesus, only in Christ Jesus do we pass from death to life. Should I just turn my microphone off? Yeah. That's the wind. It's oh, it's the wind. Air that handler. Is. That's a powerful wind. Okay. Never mind that. I thought it was my microphone. I apologize. Uh, you know, many of you may have stories of that, that like that moment, right? It, 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 all of a sudden, the love of Christ became very real to you. You said, this is what I want. And you choose that. And that, that offer is always there. That offer is always available to choose. Like, there's sort of this global idea that we can choose Christ, right? And we get to have that love of Christ in our lives. And, and, and in that moment, and maybe it's been over your whole course of your whole life, you've known God your whole life, and, and you choose life over death. But sometimes, sometimes we also choose life or death in those small moments, in those moments when we can just feel that heart pull, right? We make it in, in small decisions in those relationships. 
relationships with our coworkers, or our neighbors, or our family, or our friends. And we, we, we know when we want to choose bitterness and selfishness, or we need to choose love. Sometimes we just want to choose our flesh. We know we should choose love. And, and in Colossians chapter 3, as I mentioned, I'm going to go back and forth between Colossians 3 and 1 John 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, we get a picture of what death looks like. The trail of death in our lives. So it says in chapter, or verse 5, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Oh, that's convicting. Don't we all have stuff a little lurking within us? Right there, that, that moment, right? Look, it's there. That's our flesh. It's our humanness. That's us not being able to do it ourselves, right? That, that moment is just lurking there. So, so put to death those sinful things that are lurking in you. Have nothing to do. It gives a, a, a list of here's some of the things, right? Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater. An idolater is simply something who worships something else above God. It says, look, an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Look, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things. It made sense that you did these things when you were a part of the world because you were living sort of in death, right? When you were a part of the world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other for you've stripped off your old sinful nature, nature and all that comes with that. And, and, it, and I think it could go based on, on scripture, we could, you know, it would be all of the realm to say, we could add to this list and say self-righteousness and pride. And you know, maybe we don't have the whole list. Maybe we don't deal with all these things, but we all got a little something lurking at our hearts, don't we? I think we can find ourselves in one or two of these. <clears throat> you think, yep, yep, without the love of Christ, that's right there. Right there, that sin is crouching at the door of my heart. And this is where I would like to break down like a little toddler and give in. And I've mentioned before that some of mine are anger and rage. I, 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 and sometimes, you know, it's not out of the realm to need a little professional help to, to work through these things, right? To get lurking out of our hearts. But you know, don't you just find that people have a way of getting in our way? People just, you know, if, 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 they, if they just thought the way I thought, if they just did things the way I think they should, wouldn't it all just be easier? All right, everybody just thought the way you did or, or did things the way, but relationships would be so much easier. I mean, maybe it's your, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your siblings, maybe it's your parents, your family, maybe it's the guy in the checkout lane, but, but we're, we're in a broken relationship with other broken people, and they will hurt us. It's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when, it is a matter of when they hurt us, and then it is a matter of how we respond. Do we respond by choosing death, or do we respond by choosing life? First John 3.11 had said, the message was from the beginning that we should love one another. The problem is our own selves get in our own way. And just before this list of deaths, this life of kind of the cycle of death in uh, Colossians 3, just before this in verses 1 through 3, it says, Look, since you have been raised to new life, you have been raised to new life in Christ. Not new life within ourselves, not that we have to try to create it, not that we have to try hard enough, not that we have to push ourselves into this. Since you have been raised to new life in Christ, that your sights on the realities of heaven. I love these verses. These are such encouraging verses. These are so hopeful to me. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven. What? We get to live and dwell and have the perspective of God and the good things that he has for us in heaven. And we have a time and a future that's coming where we get to dwell in heaven for eternity. But guess what? We get to have that 
that God does it for us anyway. This is incredible news. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you had died to this life. Get this. I want you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else out of this whole month and this whole series, I want you to hear this. You have died to this life, and your real life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. I cannot tell you how this has just overwhelmed me the past couple of weeks. I can't, I, I just, I've been praying, God, give me the words to explain. Just, life, there's no life outside of Christ. It's it. There is no life outside of Christ. Everything else leads to death. You want to find life. You want to find purpose. You want to find hope. It's dying to ourselves. It is not taking a selfie. It is not putting more and more posts out on Instagram and raising ourselves up. It is dying to ourselves and being to raised to new life so that we can have all that God would have for us. You want to find real life. It is in Christ Jesus. You won't find it anywhere else. He says, since you have been raised to new life, you've, been, you've died to your flesh. Yes, there's an initial forgiveness. Yes, there may be a time where, where you receive Christ for the first time and you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to make this sort of this glow. You may, be, you may be delivered from things in your past. There may be things that you still need to be delivered from. I have seen people be delivered. I have been delivered from things. But you know what? There's also this ongoing process, day by day, of dying to our own flesh so that we can have new life, so that we can have real life, as Colossians tells us, in Christ. Because you know what? New day comes new circumstances, and new people, and new problems, and new things we didn't like. People getting in the way of the way we think things should be. Fern Street tells us we have to die to ourselves, so we can have real life in Christ, so that we can have all the goodness that God has for us. So in that moment, in that moment when we feel sin is crouching at the door of our hearts and we want to give in to our flesh, God says, I offer you a choice. I'm not telling you that you have to create this new life yourself. I'm simply offering you the choice. Death or life. Colossians 3, 10, after that, after that paragraph of death, Colossians 3, 10 through 15 says, Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it does not matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized, slaved or free, rich or poor, some uh, different places where this bench says male or female. Look, it doesn't matter who you are. Christ is all that matters and Christ is what lives in us. So since God chose you to be a holy people that he loves and he chooses everyone, this is an invitation for everyone. He loves us all. Will we respond in love to him? He says, you must clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy. These are, these are attributes of God. Clothe yourselves. Let yourself be transformed. Let yourself put on a law that says, you just clothe yourselves with tender heart and mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. You know what? If sin is crouching at the door of my heart, it's probably crouching at the door of the heart of people that we are in relationship with, too, isn't it? And if God can forgive me in the times where I choose toddler or for mature adult, <laughs> if, God can, if God can forgive me, then, then I ought to be able to forgive others, too. Right? We're going to talk more about that on Valentine's Day, so come on over for that. Uh, it says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body are called to live in peace, and always be thankful. Love that. There is death to ourselves, so that we can have real life in Christ. We don't have to create that life, but we do have a choice. We choose death, we choose ourselves, our flesh, or we choose the love of Christ. I'll tell you what, I was faced with that choice on my car right over here. Hang on. Choose love. Forget the situation, choose love. There's two things. No matter what you choose, 
There's two things that are going to happen. One is that whatever you choose will change the trajectory of your life. Whatever you choose will have an impact on the trajectory of your life. And whatever you choose will be cyclical. It will happen in cycles and patterns, both for yourself and for the people that you are in relationship with. And we're actually going to talk a little bit more about that in two weeks. But if you choose to be renewed by the powerful love of Jesus Christ, it will impact you. It will become a lifestyle. There will be a rhythm and pattern of being renewed, and you'll, consider, you'll continue to see that renewal and that transformation, and there will be more, and it will absolutely impact and change the people around you. But the same is true if you choose death. you choose that sin that is crouching at the door, that flesh, you'll find yourself in a pattern. And for some of you, you may find yourself in generational patterns, things that have been passed on from generation to generation. But you know what? You can be the one to break it. Or you may find yourself in a habitual pattern that has a grip on your life, but now is the time to break it. And if you choose flesh, it will grow, and that pattern will go, and it also will impact the lives of those around you. God says, look, I, I'm inviting all of you into a life of love. I will renew you. I will raise you from death to life. I will give you my very presence. I will pour out in you. You will have life like you've never experienced. You'll find hope and peace and purpose in my presence. But I offer you the choice. Death or real life. give us new opportunities and new, so your word says your mercies are new every morning, that you will, that you will renew us. So Lord, we're, we're grateful that you would pour out your very self on us, that you would offer us, God, that you wouldn't abandon us, that you wouldn't ask us to just get our act together ourselves, but instead, Lord, you would offer us yourself so that we may be transformed by your presence to be more like you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you didn't ask us to change. Thank you that you didn't ask us to get it all figured out. You just said, choose my love. And so Lord, we come before you today. And I, and I, and I, and I want to choose your love. Pour out on us. Praise you, God. Thank you for who you are. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
Lord, we thank you that there's nothing that can separate your love from us. Lord, the magnitude of the way that you love us. Lord, I thank you that that is where we can love as well. Lord, it changes how we respond. It changes how we act. Lord, I, just, I pray that your love would be more real to us this week, that we would feel your presence. Lord, that we would feel your favor on our lives. Name we pray. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday.